The information age, we live in it. We all have access to the sum of human knowledge at our fingertips all the time. Of course, some people choose to use that capability to argue with strangers and look at videos of cats, but lots of us also use the internet to explore and discover new information. And there is lots of new information out there. Often it feels like too much. So much that filtering accurate information from myths or lies can be difficult. The Soviet Union as a topic is no different, with years of propaganda and lies distorting or obscuring reality. I'm your host David, and this week we decided to take a look at 10 myths about the USSR. This is The Cold War. We're going to be talking about myths, but you know what isn't a myth? Data security. In the 21st century, it's all about information security and stable access. And the sponsor of this video, NordVPN, is all about that. This multiple award-winning service, including Best VPN Service of 2020, has more than 5,000 super-fast servers in 60 countries, which means that you'll always have numerous options to choose from, and it even works in China. NordVPN doesn't log your data and protects you while you're traveling with its double data encryption technology. It's also super customer friendly with 24-7 customer support, a 30-day money-back guarantee, and supports up to six simultaneous connections with unlimited bandwidth across all your devices, no matter if it's Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, or Android. NordVPN is offering our viewers a special Cyber Month deal. Go to nordvpn.com slash the Cold War to get 73% off the two-year plan plus one month free. Myth number one, there were no elections in the Soviet Union. There were elections, but they functioned very differently from how they're envisioned in the West. The USSR was a totalitarian single party regime. This isn't a question. But as I'm sure you already know, there were power struggles that went on throughout the country's history. They just didn't happen via parliaments or public debate or political campaigning, but instead happened inside the ranks of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the CPSU. It was there that ambitious party officials, bureaucrats, military and industrial leaders, former Komsomol activists, and the like, would struggle against each other for more influence over the widest variety of things, be it nepotism or regionalism, to actual professional and effective work. Okay, so you may be wondering, what does this have to do with elections? Well, elections were held to vote for candidates at various levels of government, be it the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, the Supreme Soviet of each of the republics, the Soviets of working people's deputies, and so on. Where the CPSU came into this is that they were one of two bodies that could nominate a candidate for election. Some public organizations which accepted CPSU leadership and the 1936 constitution could also nominate candidates. So who could vote? Well, the Soviet Union practiced universal suffrage with only convicts and patients of mental institutes barred from voting. Elections were held every four years, and voting was done by secret ballot. But we need further explanation for clarity, don't we? In practice, voters could put a blank ballot in the box if they intended to vote for the CPSU candidate. Voters who wanted to vote but not for the CPSU nominee had the option to vote for none of the above. This could only be done, however, by going behind a curtain at the voting booth to manually write that on the ballot. So what you had was a binary choice, only one of which required a voter to go behind a curtain. The choice that required that just happened to be the dissenting choice, an easy way for the government to identify anyone who openly opposed the CPSU. As you can imagine, the number of voters who did that was extremely small. For example, in the 1966 elections for the Supreme Soviet, only 0.2% of voters chose none of the above. So why have elections at all if the outcome is already known? Well, even the most oppressive states seek some form of official legitimacy, and these elections serve the purpose well for the CPSU. That it was designed to help identify potential opponents was just a bonus. So there you have it, elections in the Soviet Union. On paper, they not only existed, but enjoyed universal suffrage and a secret ballot. It just doesn't take much digging to uncover that these elections had a different form and served a very different purpose than democratic elections in the West. Myth number two, 
corruption did not exist in the Soviet Union. I find this particular notion to be quite laughable when I see it crop up in conversations, but it seems to persist at a low level, so we're including it on this list. The myth itself is that levels of corruption in the Soviet Union were very low to non-existent. Often cited are the laws, regulations, and practices that forbid corruption. The fact that Stalin, at the time of his death, had very few personal possessions, really only amounting to some clothing and tobacco, is also pointed out as being proof somehow that there was no corruption. After all, Stalin was a totalitarian dictator and really could have taken whatever he wanted for himself. Of course, this argument ignores the fact that he didn't need to actually put his name on an object for him to be able to use it as his own. As a totalitarian dictator, he lived a pretty luxurious life, taking advantage of state resources as if they were his own. For example, the state dachas reserved for the senior leadership were rebuilt and renovated several times, but were really only ever used by Stalin himself. But even if we choose to ignore that, corruption was a definite facet of Soviet life, ranging from petty bribery to nepotism to blot to falsifying cotton harvest numbers for an entire republic. So let's dig in a bit. Reports from 1970 indicated that one quarter of all crime in the Soviet Union was made up of bribery and embezzlement, with the Soviet Supreme Court even acknowledging the existence of corruption, stating that bribery, quote, represented a major social danger and required decisive measures to eradicate it, end quote. Izvestia, a mouthpiece of the regime, noted in 1974 that instances of embezzlement and irresponsible attitudes towards material goods are still quite common. And what does this mean in practice? Well, it could mean a wide range of things. There is the prominent case of Sharov Rashidov, the first secretary of the Uzbek Communist Party, who year after year exaggerated the amount of cotton produced in the Republic in order to secure large payment transfers to the Republic, which were then siphoned off to Rashidov and many others in the Uzbek Communist Party. But Rashidov is an extreme example. Everyday corruption was all but normal. Petty bribery was common, with many people resorting to it in order to facilitate everyday activities, like skipping the line when grocery shopping. Party and state officials would take bribes in exchange for favors, like speeding up the process of buying a car or getting a house. But we should point out, money wasn't the only transaction. It could be an exchange of favors between people. This informal type of corruption has become known as blot and is a fascinating subject all on its own. So, all of this to say, the Soviet Union most certainly experienced a high degree of corruption and was pretty much an aspect of everyday life. Okay, myth number three. It's common thought in the West that the people of the Soviet Union hated the regime and the Soviet system and that the only thing that stopped them from overthrowing it all was mass repression and surveillance. But this is a tough one to definitively prove since there's a lack of hard evidence like election results or opinion polls. Okay, I mean, those do exist, but their validity is questionable at best, given that elections were pretty much a sham, and opinion polls being not only rare, but likely not very honest in their methodology, let alone responses. So what data can we use to assess if the citizenry of the Soviet Union hated the regime? Well, there's both anecdotal evidence and opinion polls conducted across the various republics since the collapse of the Soviet Union. These sources each have their own challenges, but do give a general picture of the situation, and that is that many people didn't hate the Soviet regime. So how do we account for this? Well, let's consider propaganda. From at least kindergarten age and all the way until their death, Soviet citizens were inundated by propaganda, promoting the benefits and the victories of the Soviet system. Now, there's no question that most people saw the propaganda for what it was, but there's also no doubt that the propaganda campaigns impacted most people's worldview, helping them to feel pride in their country. This would have been helped by the Soviet education system, which, while it was quite decent, did not encourage free inquiry and critical thinking, and instead imposed ready-made analytical formulas on students. Let's also keep in mind that the Soviet Union lived inside an information bubble, with little access to outside, unfiltered information. With a lack of any sort of comparison, many people genuinely felt that Soviet life was the best in the world. 
This was backed up by a living standard that was gradually improving through the Soviet period until the stagnation of the late 70s really took hold. All of this would have engendered a content and somewhat complacent population. And to back this up, a 2020 poll conducted by the Russian Levada Center found that only 18% of respondents disagreed with the statement that the Soviet era had been the best period in the country's history. Does this mean that the citizens loved the Soviet Union? No, but it does show that they didn't hate it either. Okay, time for myth number four. The Soviet Union eradicated religion. This is a myth that certainly has had some legs, but just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Okay, so atheism and anti-religious propaganda was a key and crucial part of Soviet ideology ever since the October Revolution. The Soviet regime closed religious institutions, persecuted clergy, and conducted aggressive anti-religious propaganda, all in line with the tenets of Marxist ideology. These campaigns were initially primarily directed at the Russian Orthodox Church in a bid to remove the very strong political and economic power it had enjoyed in Imperial Russia and posed a strong threat to the power of the new Soviet regime. As the communists consolidated their power, these anti-religious attacks were expanded to other religions as well, including Judaism and Islam. But, and here is a but Sir Mix-a-Lot would be proud of, the regime found it extremely difficult to eradicate religiosity even in the pre-war Stalinist era. Religious customs, especially in predominantly Muslim regions, were intrinsically part of everyday life, including legal, economic, and social aspects. The 1937 census indicated that, despite over 15 years of anti-religious messaging, 56% of the Soviet population considered themselves believers. Momentum in anti-religious campaigns was lost during the Great Patriotic War as Stalin became much more tolerant of religiousness, all part of the strategy to mobilize and motivate the citizenry in the fight against Nazi Germany. Khrushchev was the last Soviet leader to actively persecute religion in the USSR in a series of campaigns that lasted until he was removed from office in 1964. The Soviet leaders who followed all pursued paths of unofficial religious toleration, recognizing that the power that the major religious organizations wielded was largely not a threat to the Soviet state. So there you have it. The active anti-religious campaigns of Lenin and Stalin's era, as well as Khrushchev, had broken the institutional power of the major religious bodies, but people themselves remained believers. Religion was in no way eradicated, allowing it to make a very real resurgence in many of the republics following the 1991 collapse. Now, myth number five. The Soviet Union was a worker's paradise. This one always makes me laugh when I see somebody trotted out in a discussion, or as often as not, an argument about life in the Soviet Union. But let's talk about it. So, one of the principal tenets of Marxism is the struggle of the working class to free themselves from the shackles of oppression in order to lead the fight to establish a classless society. The working class, specifically the industrial working class, was to be the vanguard class, the locomotive of a global revolution. Once the shackles of class had been removed, workers and society as a whole would be able to realize the fruits of their labor instead of only enriching the upper classes. Workers would not only guide and direct production, but conditions would improve. Now, in the early years of the revolution and the Soviet state, the working class did play a very prominent role in its formation and direction, as Lenin called it, the dictatorship of the proletariat. But Lenin died very early in the life of the Soviet Union, and his successor, Joseph Stalin, had a very clear vision and direction of the industrialization that the USSR needed to undertake. As a result, working conditions became very harsh. Then Neprilivka was introduced, a five-day working week, but rest days were randomized over the seven-day week in order to ensure that the factories never stopped producing. The trade unions, whose purpose was to represent and protect workers' rights, and which had played such a pivotal role in the revolutionary struggle against the empire, were by this point only really a thing on paper. They had become totally subservient to the Communist Party leadership, who were, more or less, emerging as a new ruling class. Labor decisions were made by the party, which were often not in the best interests of workers, but rather to the benefit of the party. 
And the alienation of labor wasn't only at that level, but also at the individual factory level, as bosses and managers were appointed by the party and not by the workers. Instead of being involved in the decision-making process, workers were paid wages to work as they were told by the new class above them, just like in the capitalist society they were supposed to have overthrown. Now, there is validity that living standards for Soviet workers did increase during the Cold War period, because, well, they did. But nobody can claim that living and working conditions ever achieved the status of workers' paradise, no matter what the propaganda would claim. And to add insult to injury, workers lacked the political rights which could have helped them improve their situation. Any attempts at dissent and protest were met with suppression, including outright violence. The Novocherkask massacre is a prominent example of this. So that's our first five myths. We need to split this across two episodes, otherwise, well, we'd be here all day. We do hope you've enjoyed this episode, and to make sure you don't miss the next five myths, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have given a bottle of vodka to a woman at the bread shop who can then make sure to set aside a few loaves to give to the shop foreman to make sure he sets aside a few sheets of corrugated iron to give to the receiving clerk at the electronics store so he can reserve you that new TV you wanted but can never get thanks to the party members always getting theirs first. Oh yeah, uh, press the bell button, would you? We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com and we're active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, your financial support would be greatly appreciated via patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is The Cold War Channel, and don't forget, the trouble with The Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated. <laughs>